you've tuned into Invisi Youth Chat Sessions, a video podcast series. Our episode starts right now. Here's your host, Dominique Vale. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Invisi Youth Chat Sessions, where you can check in for your dose of stigma-breaking, humor-filling, motivation-loving, life hacks, and motivation for all of the medically adult people in life. I'm Dominique Vail, founder of Invisi Youth and host of the Invisi Youth Chat Sessions, and today, I cannot tell you how stoked I am to read this bio card here for my two guests, and I just buried the lead. It's not one guest, but I have two joining me for today for our next episode in season 3B. A large portion of our community does love some good reality TV. I am a victim of that as well. And we know for even our non-American audience, they also know and love where one of my incredible guests is known for now from The Bachelor. Um, so I know many people from Invisi Youth as well are going to be very excited about that because many of you have hosted bachelor viewing parties to fundraise. I have done that as well. Circa Ari season, I'll just date myself for aging when I did my first one. Um, and we're really excited to not only have Abigail Herringer, who was on the most recent season of The Bachelor, but we also have her wonderful older sister, Rachel, joining us too. So the Herringer sisters were both born with congenital hearing loss and when each of them turned two, they had cochlear implants. So they had that similar bond being 18 months apart as well, similar to my sister and I say, it's like a pseudo twin dynamic between <laughs> the two. And while there is a international audience of over half a million followers on Instagram for Abigail now, and people know and love her, for her being on The Bachelor, making it very far, which is a very congratulations on that. And also being known as one of the first contestants with a disability, having a his hidden disability in CIs, but also from being on season 25, she really is so well-rounded beyond just being on the show. She was born and raised in Oregon and along with her sister, Abigail, and at her sister, Abigail, her sister, Rachel, I'm going to, I guarantee you guys, it's not the first time I'll do it. Um, they also have two younger brothers, Alistair and Stuart, and both of them were born and raised in Oregon, went through schooling there. Abigail went and graduated with a BS in finance from Linfield College, where she also played golf during her studies. And not only in this time frame has she not only been on The Bachelor, she's moved to New York and maintained working as a client financial manager for a brand and events and marketing agency, boss woman. And lo and behold, the genetic genes in the Herringer family for empowered women goes right over to Rachel's older sister, Abigail's older sister, Rachel, too. Rachel has so many equal gifts as well. She was not only one of the youngest people to undergo cochlear implantation surgery at Oregon Health and Science University, but she also has thrived in schooling. We have a mutual bond. She also played tennis during her schooling, and she has a BI in civic communication and media from Williamette University, and now is an accounts manager at a commercial, at a commercial insurance agency in Portland. So this dynamic duo is not only sister goals, but we are having our first sibling interview with the two of them, their first interview together. And in Busy Youth, I will say, we'll give the both of them our final rose. Of course, <laughs> well, I myself, and that is it. Everyone say hello to Abigail and Rachel. Guys, thank you so much for being on the show. Hello, thank you for having us. Excited to be here and chat with you. <laughs> yes, I am. I said I said one bachelor pun, and it sounded way better on the card instead of in when I said it out loud. So we won't do any more of those. But I <laughs> think so you guys can get to know Rachel and Abigail better, and we are going to do what we love to do with our guests: something called illest superlatives. Illest superlatives. Invisi Youth. Superlatives is one of our segments that we love to do for not only you guys getting to know our guests better, but also it's one that we do when we get to have two guests that are in a relationship, like our lovely sibling relationship here. So Abigail and Rachel are going to be giving superlatives to each other that are a little quirky because that's how we like to do it here. So Rachel, Abigail would most likely be found doing what if she was home alone? 
she probably would be eating a bowl of fruit and watching a documentary on Netflix in bed. Oh, I guess we did that today. <laughs> there you go. Oh my God, I love that. Documentaries on Netflix. I will dive deep into a documentary binge on Netflix for sure. Um, Abigail, what's Rachel most likely to always win at? Is there a game or activity she's most likely to always win at? So last time, or the last few times I was home, we did a geography quiz. So we had to write down like all the states and like the shortest amount of time and she kicked all of our butts in that. So I'm gonna go ahead and say that. Um, naming the 50 states the fastest. Um, has, do you do it in a song? That's the only way I can remember it, Rachel, is the alphabetical song. <laughs> I think I got really lucky that one time when we were all doing it and I just <laughs> went through a visual map. But um, yeah, no, I... I need to learn that song because then I can definitely beat them every single time. <laughs> All right, Rachel, what would, if you were planning group dates, what would be the date that Abigail would most likely win immediately on? So that's a good question. I went back and forth between two answers. One, obviously, if they went golfing, I think Abigail would kick some butt. But she also does have a unique quality and trait as far as doing like those 1000 piece puzzles and really committing to it and so I could just see everyone else wanting to give up and Abigail would just be in the corner <laughs> finishing this puzzle so um but definitely one of those two I think she would just kick I, some butt for sure I, yeah. a, a puzzle a puzzle can tell you a lot about someone it really it seems like yeah. three person to detail yeah <laughs> And staying on the reality theme side, Abigail, what reality show would Rachel most likely be on? So something I've noticed that every time I'm with her, she always knows the most random facts. So whether it's watching a movie, going somewhere, she just knows the most random facts. So I thought Jeopardy, I Ooh. thought she went on Jeopardy, she would be good at kind of trivia, kind of random facts on that. Ooh, go. Rachel, just with the, the serious mind over here. <laughs> um, okay, um, Rachel, what would be three of the best adjectives to describe Abigail? Only three, but I would say she's witty, she's loyal, and she's very, very kind-hearted. Oh, I'm gonna have a sibling, and Abigail, I'm gonna Stop. ask you the same. <laughs> <laughs> Abigail's like, can you give me three more? Three more. <laughs> And Abigail, same question. If, what are the best three adjectives to describe Rachel? Yeah, I'd probably say caring. I say loyal too and funny. Oh, I love that. Oh, this is making me have some foam on my Oh, man. Okay. Um, and then we're going to do final ones. So, Abigail, um, what's a best m memory of, like, feeling like a proud younger sister with, uh, with Rachel? <sighs> feeling like a proud younger sister. Actually, I have to say when she got her corgi, Louie, just because I do remember our parents being like, you know, that's a lot of responsibility to get a dog, especially in your 20s, and she went for it, and I don't think I've seen a better dog parent, so I think that was a pretty cool moment, and we got Louie out of it. I, I mean, spoiler for everyone, going on Abigail's, uh, not Abigail, going on Rachel's Instagram, Louie is one of the most photogenic corgis I've ever seen. Um, so great slow mo run, which I think Rachel's done a few times. I've noticed over the months, Louis' slow mo model run is prime. Um, and then Rachel, that would be my last one for you too. Have, what is sort of a best memory of Abigail's that you would say is a proud older sister? Definitely, I think you know we all saw Abigail go on The Bachelor, but that was one of the first times I really got to see Abigail in her element, explaining her hearing loss. You know, we went separate ways after college, so we never really saw each other's journey um, until we, you know, we came home. We had to talk about it, but the way she carried herself with such grace, grace, and how courageous she was, it was. I was just so proud to watch and watch her on TV and, you know, selfishly say, you know, that's my little sister. So um, definitely when she went on The Bachelor and uh, shared her truth. Yeah. I love that. Abigail, you got it. It's like now you have to top yourself from this experience. It's just <laughs> you're only allowed from here. <laughs> 
we're gonna go right off of that and go straight into our next segment where I'm excited to get some empowerment from these ladies for everyone. It is Path to Power. Path to Power. Path to Power is our fun chat segment where we get to talk with our guests about how they create power in each day for themselves and also in the dynamic they have for each other. We know so many of you guys listening or watching on our YouTube, which you should see because I think all three of us have very unique backgrounds behind us and you have to see the aesthetics. I vote for the YouTube if you are not, if you're just listening to this. Um, So you guys can get to see the dynamic between siblings that you may have as well and really get some advice from these wonderful sisters and also their siblings of four. So we get a whole dynamic with that too. So I know something even Rachel touched on it beforehand was um, what struck out to me so much and to so many people watching you, Abigail, on The Bachelor was night one, you even mentioning Rachel and saying that watching your sister's journey as she's gone through her teens and into her 20s um, with CIs and with hearing loss as well. It really shaped a lane of confidence for yourself. So going into such a new environment as that show and you're around not only production sides, but being around new women and it's social and dating and all those things. Did you ever find yourself in that setting sort of recalling pieces of advice or moments of yourself thinking, how to handle different situations to kind of motivate yourself through it? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, It's kind of what I talked about the first night was, you know, I really grew up kind of following Rachel just because we had a lot of the same teachers, a lot of the same friends. And so I was always really lucky that she was more vocal since she kind of went through it first. And so growing up, I kind of had it all set up for me by the time, you know, I came into the classroom and everything. But I think what I really took with that, you know, going into the experience like the show is, you know, just letting people know right away. You know, I told Matt right away. I told the producers right away, the girls, um, just because I think it just, it makes it easier for everybody, you know, because people don't know how to help you if you're, you know, not upfront with what you need help with. Um, so yeah, so I really just kind of took that with me. And I just found, you know, the more vocal I was about it, the more confident I seemed about it. And it was just easier for all of us just to talk about it. Yeah. And even, even like you said, sort of that immediate transparency probably in a way it's sort of that beginning step of oh I'm just going to fake it till I make it and feel super confident out of the gate but then eventually you probably felt that sort of immediate confidence in sort of every interaction you were having as the time went on too. Mm -hmm. Yeah no no, definitely. And Rachel kind of even going off of that um, being the eldest sibling not only just with Abigail but you have two other brothers as well Um, that does, I know for my older sister, it's just the two of us, but that does sort of, um, put not so much of a pressure, but you do want to make sure that if you're making mistakes that you're sort of showing how you kind of, how you handle fumbles and things like that. So are, were there ever moments of you growing up and especially dealing with, um, having hearing loss yourself or just sort of growing up that you felt as the older sibling, you were trying um, to sort of make the right decisions for you, but also that you would be able to help Abigail and your other siblings moving forward. Definitely. And, you know, I credit my parents a lot in this and that they really, the support and love that they gave to us, it was really equal across the board. Um, But as far as being the oldest, I, you know, had the daunting task of doing a lot of the things first. (laughs) Um, And I think, you know, we can all agree, no one is perfect, no situation is going to be perfect. So I really just try to go in and give my absolute best because that's what I would hope that my siblings would want to do as well. Um, So, you know, they've seen me succeed. They've seen me, you know, fall flat on my face sometimes. But in each of those uh, scenarios, I just hope that I've modeled that, you know, if you fall down, you get back up and you just keep, you keep going. Um, But definitely being the older sibling, I have to say, like, doing all those first, it's so rewarding at the end to then in turn see them experience all of that and grow up and maybe here and there be like, who told you that? That was me, wasn't it? <laughs> but um, no, it's it's been super fun. And the same thing with my younger brothers as well. Um, it's been it's been fun. So 
Yeah, I was going to say as a as a younger, uh, even though Rachel and I are the same age as 28, I, we're 18 months apart. My sister and I were similar in that regard of with Abigail um, being the younger of the two of you. And I do, even my sister, I would be nice when you're watching them do things that you know you'll end up doing in a similar setting, whether that was in social environments. Um, if, if you hear a honking, um, shop around, you know, if living in New York, so we, like I said, the ambiance, instruction, ambulance, everything, that's all on my side. It's, it's, we're in real time, guys, we're giving you real New York experiences for everyone who wants to travel to the city and can't, that's what we're giving you from an auditory experience, but, um, yeah, it was, um, kind of, that was kind of going off of that. I wanted to ask, I would probably toss the question to Abigail first, and she kind of falls in the middle of it. Was your, um, a lot of people have some siblings who have similar health issues or disabilities, and then other times they have other siblings who are, we put it in air quotes, healthy and non-disabled in that regard. So if you're, did you find yourself in your dynamic with Rachel being different than your dynamic with your brothers because of similar similarities that you and Rachel would have versus what you would have as similarities with your brothers as well? Yeah, um, you know, naturally, I think I am closer with Rachel just because our younger brothers are much younger. Um, you know, I'm 26, Rachel's 28, and then Alistair and Stewart are 17 and 19. Um, but I think if we were closer in age, I don't think, a, you know, our hearing loss would be something that I would gravitate more towards Rachel. Um, you know, I think it's more, yeah, you know, we get to go to doctor's appointments together. You know, if we have something frustrating happen with our cochlear implant, then, you know, I probably talk to Rachel about it. Um, but I mean, that's what's incredible about our brothers is they've always been very understanding. You know, if we're in a loud situation and we can't hear anything, they're always the first to repeat it for us. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I think it's more of an age thing for us, um, but I, I don't think our hearing loss really has anything to do with, um, you know, just because I'm closer to Rachel, you know, so far. Yeah, and I like I like kind of how you said that too. It's what what are similarities between you is sort of what will bond you versus versus other parts of the dynamic. I'll always say a lot of my a lot of even my friendships and even with my sister, she doesn't have health issues like I do. But there's certain elements of her personality we're very similar on. So I'll always encourage people to kind of connect on what bonds you, but then be sort of that beam of support for your other siblings or your other friends on the things that you might differ on because you can exactly. be that like circle of trust unit for one another, which is quite a nice thing, like you mentioned. I love that you said they're the first ones to repeat something for you as well. That's a really I really yeah. shout out to your two brothers on that one. As, and they have such great names too. That was my favorite thing as a unit. <laughs> shout out to your mom, the name choice. I know, she came through with them. <laughs> um, and, and Rachel, kind of last question for this. What would be advice for that you would kind of give to people that um, are a sibling who has a chronic illness or disability that wants to kind of power up or strengthen their relationship with their siblings? What are things that you've noticed over the years that have helped kind of tie you close with Abigail and then also with your brothers? For sure. I think, you know, with Abigail, we are fortunate in that we're literally in the same situation. So as far as day to day, um, you know, if we miss something or something needs to be repeated, we just like know in the back of your hand, you know, she, if I missed it, she probably missed it. Um, but I think, especially with my brothers, just having those conversations with them and letting them know, like, I really need this repeated because I didn't hear it and this is why I didn't hear it. And, you know, they slowly just start, uh, just, it becomes normal. It just becomes like just an instinct even. So when we ask them to repeat something, it's, oh yeah, they said this. And it's not even a kind of a, it's more of a, just an afterthought almost. Um, but I think as far as powering up your relationship with your siblings, venture out, go out and do things. I think it's so much fun. Um, I know when we first went into lockdown, Abigail and I, we made a point to go for like an hour walk every day. Um, and just to get outside, um, we also tried new restaurants. This was pre pre lockdown, <laughs> um, but we would venture out and try new restaurants. Um, sometimes we go golfing. Um, our family loves to go golfing as well. We'll just go to the driving range and basically just watch my dad hit some really bad shots, and we all bond over it. <laughs> but um, no, I think um, 
if you're out and doing something, it just, you, you just get that little bit of a serotonin boost going because you're moving your body, you're outside. And I think that just brings you closer because I know Abigail and I, we do talk a lot, but we also don't talk a lot as far as um, really having some deep conversations. We, that's just not our wavelength. And so if we can go out and spend time together. That's what's valuable, valuable to us um, just being in the moment together. So. Yeah, I really like that. That's something I'll, I'll say as well as a good thing to remind people with sibling dynamics is so much we'll say, oh, we'll just keep communication and talk. But a lot of times talking isn't the my my in sort of a platonic love language, if you will, is not verbalizing. My sister will love chatting about her feelings. Um, <laughs> me, not so much. Um, I'd rather sort of like, I would rather get some like, she can hug me if I'm having a bad day and just give me some cuddles and watch TV with me. That, that will solve mine. But she wants right. to talk about her feelings. So we kind of know our dynamic. And that's what it is. So like you said as well, really kind of knowing your strengths and weaknesses, but also um, something that I can kind of gauge from you and Abigail talking even with um, your brothers is just them being around you um, and getting to kind of hear what works well and what doesn't from with you guys having hearing loss, it allows them to build their empathy and their ability to adapt. Definitely. And that as well for them going into their social environments or work or schooling, it makes them sort of just better individuals because they're learning really important life skills from having you as sisters, which is exactly. a really great thing to remind people. It's not always the challenging moments when you see a sibling struggle. It's also the things you gain out of that sibling having to adapt to the things that they have going on. Definitely. You should remind them how lucky they are to have us as sisters. <laughs> We're gonna all put this out, guys, and you can send that in a group chat with the brothers. And be like, We're just reminding you. <laughs> And going right off of that, we're about to go into our intermission segment of the show. But before we do that, I like to always remind our viewers to thank everyone who always tunes into the Invis Youth chat sessions, whether on our audio platforms, but also on our YouTube channel. This is one of our virtual programs we provide throughout the year monthly, along with all of our other virtual resources, leadership programs, and all of our activism campaigns that we do that we get to provide for free for so many young adults throughout the world that we work in. So we always do pop the um, donation link up if you are capable and able to even share it, donate, whatever works for you. It's always super impactful for us to A, keep the lights on, but also continue all of our resources and programming remaining free throughout the year. So we always thank you guys for that, for being um, for being such wonderful listeners and viewers of this program, our, our entertainment educational tool, as I like to say. Mm -hmm. um, and going off of that, I get to take a break from hosting and I get to have Abigail and Rachel tell us a story. Guys, it's the best segment. It's so that one time. <laughs> so that one time. You all know why I love So That One Time. It's when I get to stop talking and my guests get to take the mic and share a life story with us. And I always love, you guys are watching me right now if you're watching on YouTube, but seeing the complete different facial reactions from Abigail being <laughs> calm and collected to the story time, Rachel looking a little nervous about going into story time. So I'm going to sit and relax and let the Herringer sisters tell us a story. All right. Do you care who goes first? You can, you, I'm going to give you the floor first. Younger goes first on this show. Oh, the younger sister. I love that. <laughs> I love that. Okay. Um, so a funny story. So growing up, um, both Rachel and I, we never really called our cochlear implants. Cochlear implants, we always said our ear. So, you know, if we were out, it was, oh, my ear died or where's my ear so forth. But you know, growing up, going to school, like we never really registered that other students might not realize that we're talking about our processors when we say our years. And I remember I was playing like a 
like a game or something and my cochlear implant flew off and I was like oh my god my ear fell off and I'm like <laughs> screaming it I'm looking for it and there was like this girl that was like freaking out because she thought like my ear like my actual ear like fell off and then it was just like the funniest thing ever because she was like crying like she was freaking out and then I'd be like oh no I met like my my processor <laughs> but um no it's just funny because I think we just always grew up calling it our ears and we just never really registered that other people don't always pick up on that well the, the sheer trauma that probably kept for that whole <laughs> of yours waiting like where's the blood what happened <laughs> around the room there was so much going on that day yeah <laughs> i love that and now rachel tell me tell me a story too okay well i don't have as a funny one as yeah. that but <laughs> that, that, is, that is pretty funny that's happened to me too um I think the empowering story, I just remember being at Abigail's college graduation and just feeling this overwhelming sense of pride um, and really proud of her because college for both of us was really the first time that we were on our own, you know, from our family, we were out of the house and then not even with each other. Um, and I think that was really the turning point for both of us as far as figuring out our identity, you know, how we wanted to share our story, um, you know, how we wanted to talk about it. and. You know, it was one of those things. I, I didn't cry, but I just you could definitely tell that I was emotional. And you know, my mom, I think at one point looked over and was like, you know, calm down. Like I'm her mom. <laughs> but um, no, I think it's really special in that four year period for both of us because I think you know, if you looked at us from when we first entered and then are now in adulthood, um, we're still I still so close and we talk almost every day um but we really have come into our own we you know talk about our cochlear implants maybe a little bit differently maybe similarly similar similarly whatever that word is supposed to be um <laughs> but um I think that was a crucial point in our um lives where we really in a way kind of separated but we also the bond got a lot stronger because I think the respect grew for each other as far as um how much we came into our own I love that and that's really like similarly for I'm giving you an applause you did have a great start um, I love I love that because it really is similar my sister and I ended up transferring to the same universities from two separate schools so oh we didn't get away from each other um, <laughs> on that end but it was that time frame for everyone is a real big growing portion but even at that point as well, how we both kind of handled myself having accommodations for my chronic illness in university, us having similar professors at times and them right. thinking we would respond the same way. And I'm a lot more chatty. My, my sister would always lay the open groundwork of being like, oh, you're Erica's sister. And then two weeks later, I'd be like, you're not really Erica's sister. <laughs> um, so it was always, I like I said, that's a really great point to make is that even the you guys can grow and I always remind people you can grow in the same direction differently and it's just as impactful for both and I think that's something I'm I really am excited people getting to chat with both of you at the same time is seeing that even you can on paper have so much in similarity but sort of how you then execute it is really is really different so I like I like that and you can you can tell Abigail I cried a little bit at your graduation <laughs> 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 We're going to jump oh, right man. in. I'm going to let the Herringer sisters give us some hacks for life. We're going into health hack moments. Health hack moments. Yeah, we're Italians. So my sister and I required each other to cry at our graduations. Um, she was like, you are crying for me. And let, that means you didn't care to you. So we did both, actually. I think I was so nervous to cry that I started to cry <laughs> out of, like, panic. Like, you need to do it. Um, so I can relate to you, Rachel. <laughs> Health Hack Moments is probably one of my favorite segments because I get to basically open up my notes app and let my guests give us all of the good life hacks 
of thriving in life. So basically, we're going to have all of our listeners and viewers become the fifth Herringer sibling and get the advice from Rachel and Abigail. So kind of just kind of going off of right away, sort of both of you guys, like you said, you both have cochlear implants. So are there any things from you guys obviously having more than two decades with yours? Are there things for that that you've noticed like having like Abigail saying, if your if your ear died at that, are there things <laughs> that you kind of are now that you would suggest to people who have CIs that are good kind of to have on you or things you've noticed over the years? Um, yeah, I mean, I would probably just say, um, Rachel's really good about being over prepared. Um, <laughs> and so that always comes into handy, like if we're out doing something, because I think our batteries have died equally when we're out, but she always has a battery and I do not. Um, so I think that's something that she's taught me is always better to be over prepared than under prepared. I was going to say, Rachel, outside of Rachel's like, I have my list of five things. No. <laughs> Um, no, I think, you know, for, I know that your show reaches a large audience, but at least for us, we go to audiologists, um, and do hearing tests. And I think, you know, having a conversation with the audiologist, if there are program settings that might work better for you in a large group setting, there are options for that. Um, I know that Abigail and I, we, um, I personally don't use it. Um, and I'm not sure if Abigail does either, but um, there are a lot of different programs out there that people just might not know um, that exist, but they do. And so having conversations with your medical professionals about, um, you know, sometimes you could just ask a question and you think it is out there, there might be a solution for it. And so um, that was something that was told to us. We just don't use it. Um, I'm kind of that awkward person at a restaurant with my friends when we go to a table and I'm kind of playing musical chairs to try to figure out the best seat to sit at. Um, Cause I want to make sure that everyone's on my left side, which is my good side. And, you know, I'm hovering over my friends trying to scoot them out the way to sit down <laughs> in a certain spot. But um, no, I think, and yeah, always bring an extra battery. Of course. <laughs> She's gonna come out at her, She's gonna be like, "Come on!" <laughs> now every time I go somewhere, I have like Rachel's voice, like in my head, being like, "Bring the extra battery." <laughs> and I love Rachel, you pointing that out too. Is not only sort of oh wait, being remaining. If you haven't, I'm, I've had my chronic illnesses for going on fourteen years now. Um, which I feel makes me feel very old. Um, but also for you guys dealing with hearing loss for pretty much of the majority of your life as well, being curious, remaining curious with your doctors of just checking in with things that you might adapt to just through your day to day is something just for a wider network across sort of a disability and chronic illness spectrum is something a lot of people just get so used to adapting that they forget to ask the questions. Um, which was a really nice point that you brought up, which I think a lot of people can kind of relate to of wanting to think of that. Um, and kind of actually, Rachel kind of sparked what my next question was going to be for both of you was um, even just in social settings or work settings. Um, I obviously when you were on The Bachelor, um, Abigail as well, being in sort of larger social settings. Um, especially with hearing loss or with a disability, you're trying to accommodate to what you need while also accommodate to new people around you. So if you feel that sort of, I always get it too, even many years later, that sort of inner anxiety of, I don't wanna bother anyone to ask if they can do this or this for me or mention what I need. What are ways that, I'll ask both of you because you might have different ways you handle it, but for you, Abigail, first, how do you kind of go about that when you might need people to slow down talking or one at a time? How do you approach that? Yeah, um, I mean, you know, it's easier said than done. I think it's easy for me to say, oh, you know, just tell everybody at the table you need help and you need them to repeat things for you. Um, but, you know, even I don't do that every time. Um, but I think what I try to do is it's almost like a buddy system. So whoever I'm sitting next to, I might just tell that one person. Or if I'm somewhere with my best friend, they know that things need to be repeated. And I think that's just a much easier way to go about it because then you can kind of just quietly nudge and be like, oh, who are they talking about? And then they'll tell you. And then that way you don't have to make an announcement to the whole table. Um, so I think the buddy system 
really, it really helps. I, I would say, Abigail, that would have been very funny on television for you to be like, excuse me, can you <laughs> that? that would have been a great icebreaker for any drama. Been like, can you three of you just say this one more time? It's like all the dramas happening. Yeah, like, you I'm like, okay, I need you to repeat that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and Rachel, what about yourself? How do you handle those dynamics? Definitely. You know, I think both Abigail and I are really good at this, but we sometimes will just kind of use humor and just kind of keep things light. If we're really anxious, we kind of deflect it out. Um, but I will say, uh, you know, let's see, I'm 20. I'm actually 20, 27. Abigail said I was 28 earlier. I know she's adding an extra ear on me, but in the 25 years I've had my cochlear implant, I, anytime I've told someone, I have never gotten a reaction in the moment face-to-face -face where it was a sense of rejection, where um, they weren't, they just didn't want to have anything to do with it. Sometimes um, kind of a confused look on your face because when you tell someone that you're talking and you've heard them, and so for them to kind of put all of that together, it's, it can be confusing. But um, at least in my experience, I've never had that initial just rejection right up front. And so I've always kind of compared it to kind of just ripping off a Band-Aid um, because it might just be so awkward and not fun at first. But at the end of the day, once you tell people, it actually helps you more than it would help them in that situation. At least that's how I look at it. Because the sooner I can tell them, the more I'm going to hear in their conversation, you know, versus if they don't know, then they just don't know. Um, but again, like Abigail said, it's easier said than done. It does take practice. So like using her buddy system is a great way to just kind of ease into just one person. Then, you know, that buddy system then can turn into two people, then three people. And then all of a sudden it's your entire table, then you're good to go. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think, um, you know, once you tell people it, it, at least for me, it feels like a huge weight off my shoulders because then I can finally really participate and just say, if I miss something, I've missed something, but someone has my back, so. Yeah, I like that. And even I'll, I always say the biggest thing for us and probably I have framed and busy to match sort of my own personality. So everything we do is sarcastic. Um, but in but that is really, especially like you said, people, it is sort of that initial reaction of trying to put the pieces together of the situation. Um, my chronic illnesses are more in the rare disease realm. So spelling it is a complication, let alone giving <laughs> acronyms or anything. So I always will say, if, even if the first reaction isn't good, I always use humor, even if it's with the same people again, even in a work setting, if I know their first reaction, I would have given them like a C minus on reacting to me mentioning my diagnosis or my needs. I'll still come back with it because if I'm still coming back with humor, eventually they'll pick up on, okay, Dominique has asked for the same thing three times. <laughs> if I'm doing something wrong if she keeps being, saying the same thing. So right. like you said, kind of being able to, on your end, use that to kind of break the ice, but also like Abigail said too, have those, have somebody around you that's going to kind of have, be, be your ride or die on the side and be like, no, I got you. I'll, I'll fill you in on what's being missed or what's kind of going on on that side of it. Um, and kind of on a, on a fun note, I was going to ask you, the both of you have obviously through quarantine, we've all kind of picked up new trends and hacks and tips. Has there been one that either of you have sort of passed on to the other um, that you've kind of picked up through TikTok or through Instagram that you were like, oh, Rachel, <laughs> try it or vice versa? Ooh, that is a good question. I don't know if Abigail's tried anything, but I told her a lot of things to try. <laughs> like you one of them. Me, yeah. Did you tell know. me about the chlorophyll water? Did you tell me about that one? I did. Yes. The green, the green I'm water. Doing that. Oh, there you go. There we go. There we go. From one of like 100. <laughs> I have no TikTok. Our teenagers get very annoyed with me that I don't, nor does our charity. Um, but my sister does, and she will send me every video under the sun through Facebook, and one out of 15 will hit, and she'll be like, yes, I got her to like. 
So that's me. Yeah. Try, 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 and try again. I always say, keep trying. Eventually, one will stick. Um, and kind of going off of that too, I know a big thing in our sort of chronic illness and disability space is sort of self care, unwinding after a stressful day, even with um, chronic illness, a lot of times, like myself, you'll have flare ups where physically your body's just not at 100. So for both of you, are there different things that are sort of part of your health, your self care routines that you both enjoy um, that help you relax or de stress after a week? Uh, yeah, I, um, I am a big Netflix fan, and I can watch Netflix for hours. And so my go-to if I just need to dewind or, you know, decompress is uh, just, I'll just put on Grey's Anatomy. I'll throw on a face mask. Um, maybe if I have some red wine, I'll have a glass of wine. And then Lou, my dog, he'll just sit up like right here and just snuggle. And so it's almost kind of like a little weighted blanket, but just in the one corner of my body. <laughs> You're building my dream Saturday after a long week. I mean, <laughs> what about but, um, you, Abigail? What do you do? Yeah, so I used to be a big Netflix person, but lately I just feel like when I watch it, I feel like anxious. Like I feel like I should be doing something productive. Um, so I've started doing like walks, like outside. Um, I feel like that just helps, like especially in New York, just like get out of the apartment and just get some fresh air, do some people watching. Um, and then that way I still feel a little productive in the sense of, okay, I'm getting my steps in. Um, and I, I just put on like a good, feel good playlist. Um, but I, I still enjoy Netflix, obviously. Do you have a go-to song on your playlist that you're like, this, this is a nice calm, puts you in a calm mode or a good mode? Go-to song. Well, Rachel's got me hooked on Fleetwood Mac. Uh, I think any of those yeah. songs are just like, Mm -hmm. good relaxing yeah. songs yeah they will end up on a lot of our Insta instagram reels because i will then put the songs with them so <laughs> good taste good taste guys love i love that um we're gonna go into our final segment which um is i'm excited about because these two ladies both fit the defining factor of it this is rebel game changer status rebel game changer status Rebel Game Changer status is obviously our step-by-step -step of how you are able to be a game changer in your daily life. And so we're going to ask that, especially with Abigail and Rachel have really, like um, I said at the beginning, introing them with like the longest bio I've done of two guests before. They really have carved wonderful lanes for themselves, socially and professionally. So um, a one thing for all Rebel Game Changers will say at Invisi Youth is finding the way in which you like kind of breaking the mold of what people sort of assume with chronic illness or disability, especially as a person in your 20s or in going into your 30s and those teen years. Um, so I'll, I'll start with Abigail and then I'll go back to Rachel on it. So for you, are there what are ways that for you, if people feel will sort of make you feel like they're limiting you or not giving you all opportunities if they're trying to kind of stifle you a bit, what are ways you kind of handle those situations or push through those and, sh um, and show your capability? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. Um, I think more on a day-to-day -day basis, I think the thing for me is when people say never mind, um, especially like in conversation, because I feel like they're limiting me in allowing me to join the conversation and to kind of have my input in it if I don't know what's being said. Um, in terms of how I, in terms of dealing with that, um, you know, either, either I'll just ask somebody else, um, you know, find a new buddy after that, <laughs> or, um, or, you know, just be more vocal and say, you know what, actually, can you tell me like what was said? Um, because I mean, it's not fun when there's like a group setting or a group conversation going on and then you're told, never mind, and then you can't have your input in it. Um, it's kind of a smaller scale. I, I don't really think I have like a big story in terms of someone like limiting me. Um, but I mean, that's kind of a day to day occurrence that still happens. Yeah, and I'll, I think before before I pass it to Rachel, I, th I think for my friends who are in the deaf or hearing loss community or who have CIs, that's probably one of their least favorite words that will get used for, that I see is sort of a little bit more so for the hearing loss and deaf community. 
um, is that word tends to be the one that's used the most that's just so bothersome because it's just, it's not only just dismissing you, it's just dismissing being accessible for you. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I like that you mentioned that because that is something people don't really, they think one word, they're accommodating you, but actually they are, like you said, they're just not allowing you to be included. So it's not them accommodating, it's actually kind of put, putting you in the back seat of sort of the role in the room. Exactly. Rachel, on your end, where, are there other things too that have helped you in those moments? Definitely. You know, I think the support of my family and friends um, is a big one because I think the word never mind is one that just comes to mind just on a day to day basis. And um, but I just remember growing up, you know, the surgeons told my mom that, you know, your girls might not talk, your girls um, might not be able to read past a certain grade level. And so I think it's always been instilled in us to do our absolute best, but I do have to say the support, you know, my mom says, you know, you can do this. You know, I have Abigail in my corner, I have my brothers in my corner and my mom and my dad and really good friends. Um, it becomes this exciting journey where you can kind of start to prove people wrong. Um, but bringing it back to yourself. It's so rewarding to be able to surprise yourself. Um, you know, for example, like if you're working out and all of a sudden you realize you can lift a certain amount of weight and you surprise yourself that, I mean, that's a great feeling to have. And so I think a lot of the way I live my life is chasing that feeling of being able to push my limits, but, um, knowing that the reward is going to be so, so sweet. Um, but, you know, growing up, you know, people told me I couldn't sing and I definitely can't sing. So, I mean, there's also times where, you know, they'll say those things and I'm just like, you're right. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to argue with you. Um, but I definitely think, uh, and, you know, Abigail's been a huge part of this, but just having that support, just having those people in the corner that can say, you know, you can do this or, you know, what, it's okay. You can't do this, but you can do this. Um has been really, really um, a blessing to have, for sure. I love that. And even one thing I really loved about the both of you is professionally, you guys don't work in settings that are tailored to a chronic illness or disability space or for a deaf or HOH community, which is something for myself. Ironically, running in Viziv tends to put me in the box that I work in the demographic. But mm -hmm. Um, outside of that, um, doing work in publishing, having that job where I'm sort of in, I am outnumbered in terms of there aren't people in my, in that portion of my group. Um, I always encourage so many young people to know that they can have access to any type of job. So I was going to even ask um, the both of you sort of in a professional setting, are there things that um, have been helpful when you were writing your resume or when you're in your job that you noticed your boss or colleagues um, are helpful for you for people wanting to go into a space where they know it's not going to be exactly designed for the community that they might be part of? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I think I got uh, something similar in terms of did I disclose, you know, my hearing loss mm -hmm. when applying for these different jobs because it's not a common thing that, you know, it's just a field of work that doesn't have a lot of hearing loss, you know, individuals come through. And I mentioned that my first job out of college, I did it. And then my second job, I did. Um, and I just found that, you know, since it's not such a bit part of the job, it's really helpful to tell them just because there's so many things within the job that can be difficult. Um, you know, whether it's phone calls, Zoom meetings, especially since COVID. Um, it's, again, you know, it's just having to advocate for yourself just because it's something that a lot of people just aren't educated on and just don't know how to provide the resources. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that really no, answered. It, 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 it did because, because you did, you did basically trial and error both ways. So yeah. it does, it does kind of, you're able to do either, which is really important for people to know that you don't have to, especially on, on our end, you're with hearing loss and with CIs, it is relatively invisible at, in most angles, if you will. And then on my end with my, invis my illnesses are mostly invisible um, as well, unless they kind of manifest physically for me. So um, it is something you do kind of have that ability to pick. But like you said, when you kind of take that role with an interview or with a boss, 
you're able to then make your nine to five easier because they're able to know that if I can't do this with Abigail, oh, there's these different things we've done with her before. So there's all these other options that we now know about from the beginning. Is that similar for you too, Rachel, with your work? Yeah, so I actually, uh, the jobs I've had post-college, I've never disclosed it in the interview process, um, just because I think, you know, sometimes there can be a stigma or, mm -hmm. you know, discrimination when you're going through that process if you do disclose something like that. But I will say I've gotten really lucky at both jobs I've had. There is someone in there that has, you know, a spouse or a relative or a friend who is in the deaf and hard of hearing community. And so it just, it makes that conversation so much easier. But I will say it, it is a tricky thing to navigate in the professional world because it's not the same conversation that you're going to have, you know, let's say like on a first date with someone or, um, you know, when you're explaining to your friends because there's such more or it's just more casual yeah. and you can be a little bit more candid whereas I think both Abigail and I one thing we pride ourselves on is that we when we're at our job we're professional and we're tuned in we're focused and so that's probably been my biggest um struggle is trying to find that balance of how can I tell my coworkers that you know I have this situation that sometimes when I get voicemails I have a really hard time you know transcribing them essentially for myself and so I would need to ask someone but I also there's that there's that uh professional barrier that you know sometimes you don't want to not that you don't want to say too much but at the same time you don't want to just because they are your coworker. um so I want to say that's probably been the trickiest thing and I'm still kind of figuring it out as far as um how much I want to share how much I want to tell or um how much they need to know essentially so. Yeah, what we, what I kind of, what we've kind of coined as the the point with that, like you both have kind of mentioned as well as we call it the faucet theory at Invisi Youth is you can kind of change the pressure of the water being released and that sort of in that regard is you can kind of change the amount of information you are giving or yes. releasing and we'll always say for young people in the job force kind of going and working with colleagues, I, even on my end when I'm going into board meetings, if they've never read our charity's website they just assume I'm the young I'm the very young looking version of the older person running the charity um, and they don't realize I have a I obviously have chronic illnesses so it's things that I'll slowly I always say I'll I'll drop like a few little easter eggs in my sentences of I adapting to things or oh my memory yeah. loss here or I have to be ambidextrous because I can lose feeling in my left hand so I had to teach myself to be right-handed so I'll mention things and you can, like you said, for both of you guys, even with colleagues, you can kind of gauge people's reaction of somebody might immediately forthcome and say, oh, this sounds similar to something with my coworker or before. And you can then kind of figure out in a work environment what, who would work best to kind of sort of be that first nugget of information. And a lot of times I'll always say, when you have that ally in the workforce and you find yeah. a colleague or others that are not dealing with a chronic illness or disability, if you can kind of see that first empathy level when you kind of leave that piece of information, when I always will joke, when a healthy or non-disabled person asks for the accommodation, they always get it faster than when I do. So, um, um, so ironically, they always get it first. Um, their persistence isn't annoying. Um, so um, kind, of like, um, kind of like what you guys said as well is you can, it's trial and error in so many ways. And I always say, if you don't get the job on an interview and you disclose at that time, would you have wanted six, eight months into that job been working there if they immediately would have had such a negative reaction? So kind of having that uh, mindset is really is really impactful and, and you can still grow. I loved what both of you have said is you guys didn't give definitive answers of this is how it does when I'm in my job. Um, this is how it is. So I, I like how you both have framed that because that's something that evolves in your 20s into your 30s and moving forward professionally. Um, what you do is going to change always. Yeah. Well, the nice thing is everyone in my office were huge Bachelor fans. So <laughs> when they put it together that my sister was on the show and then, you know, the first night Abigail goes, well, <laughs> I have a cochlear implant. This is my situation. Then, you know, the next week at work, everyone's like, well, Rachel. <laughs> 
and then they they had the answers already so i didn't really have to say anything it was just like yeah that's my sister and we have the same story and there you go that I mean, abigail just did my work for me so abigail yeah. you're welcome um you're welcome <laughs> plan all along um <laughs> I love that. And kind of before I go to our final question, I wanted to ask one um, of Abigail, because I know um, your platforms and the amount of a platform you have has in a short amount of time so significantly increased and you're given access to so many people wanting to be a part of your day to day and get to be a part of things you enjoy. But also what kind of does come with that is sort of negative comments, negative backlash and I, I told you this when we spoke even yesterday was I, I love that you use your platform to talk about being in the hearing loss community, hidden disability. You talk about being a part of the AAPI community as well um, with both of you guys um, being part of Korean as well. And I love that you use that as a tool to, to move forward. Um, but you have talked about that. It's not, it's not like your DMs are 100% loving and appreciative all the time when you have such a platform um so for you how have you been um what would be things even i know yours is on a much larger scale versus our instagram following or uh, some of our other followers rachel's like hey mine are big. <laughs> um but but what would be things that you kind of have learned when you're trying to deal with negative comments or when you're trying to kind of navigate your way of using the platform yeah, um, I think the biggest thing is just knowing that there's no right answer. Um, I think going about telling my story, um, I wanted to make it very clear in the beginning that this is my experience. You know, this is Rachel and I's experience having a cochlear implant. It's not going to be the same for everybody. Um, and, you know, there's so many different types of hearing loss, too. And here's just what I'm representing or I'm trying to. Um, and so I've also been fortunate, too, that I think a lot of people want to be educated. I don't think they're necessarily looking for, oh, this is the right answer. And I it's almost a little bit easier than politics. I feel like just a little bit, just because I think with politics, people are so hard to bend in their ways and they want to be right and they want to have other people follow them in those beliefs. But, you know, in terms of my hearing loss, I think they want to be educated because they haven't had a lot of exposure to that. Um, and that's what I've kind of seen just with, um, you know, my messages or when I do Q&A, it's just a lot of curiosity. Um, so I've been really fortunate that it's been mostly positive. Um, but like you said, not everything's going to be positive. And I just have to remind myself that, you know, it, it kind of comes with the territory a little bit. But I, I just remind myself that I'm so lucky that I have the platform that I do and that people are wanting to learn more. Because I always thought that Rachel and I were very kind of obsolete growing up. Um, and so just to finally have people want to learn more, it's, it's been really cool. Yeah, yeah. And I really, I like how you kind of phrased that as well, is that it, it curiosity, sometimes people can think of curiosity as a negative because it comes with a level of ignorance in a way. But it's because of a lack of, of seeing people like yourself, like myself in mainstream media and seeing what adapting where people wouldn't even know you're adapting looks like and so you kind of taking people on that journey and even in the negative comments will always say even on a lower scale of people having a smaller blog or a platform that they'll use to talk about a chronic illness or disability will always kind of say in a way your your worth and your quality of worth is a personal ranking it's not up for voting so That's I'll right. kind of remind yourself of that is it's sort of the, the chaos is happening outside the house the storm can't like break into the home all the time so you have to kind of keep that and I did I complimented you yesterday but I'll say it again as well you really you being able to take what some people would say oh those are ridiculous questions don't answer but you take it in such a, a kind way of going no I'm gonna educate that person and share my version of it because like you said every version of illness or disability is different to the person because it affects everyone's body and way of living differently and so I do, I do commend you on that of just showing this is your path and people can take ideas and inspiration from how you do different things and then kind of tailor it into the way it could work for them too. Thank you. Yeah, no, I mean, I definitely want people to feel comfortable asking questions. I think that's why Rachel and I always try to be very, you know, open and positive about our experience because 
you know, if walls were adverse, if someone was kind of negative or it's almost intimidating, it kind of makes you not want to ask questions and then you don't learn. Um, so I think that's just, you know, when I do Q&As or when people come up, I just try to be as positive and open because um, it really does benefit both of us um, with that approach. Yeah. And kind of going on a, a final question with that, I always, we always end our episodes with getting our guests to give a piece of advice to our listeners and viewers um, from the life that they've lived with the chronic illness or disability connections they have. So um, I'll, I'll go, I'll go eldest to youngest this time around. We will pass it to Rachel first. <laughs> Rachel's like, yes, my time. Um, <laughs> so, so for your end, sort of, um, what would you kind of give for young adults that are in that sort of teens into their 20s that are trying to kind of cultivate their own life and their lane um, in this age of having social media as well um, in your social network and wider what would be sort of your piece of advice for a young person that's also growing up with a chronic illness or disability? Definitely. You know, my mom has this saying that, you know, it's a journey, but we all get there. Um, and it's really true. You know, we all, everything works out, you know, at will. Um, I know, especially all the pressures in your 20s. You know, I'm in my mid 20s and I still hate paying my bills. I still uh, still have not figured out a way not to do that. But, you know, adulthood. But um, just constantly looking at that bigger picture, um, you know, every day is not going to be an amazing day. But just because it wasn't an amazing day doesn't mean it wasn't a productive day. Um, and so I really think, you know, once you look at the bigger picture, maybe slow things down you'll realize that you are exactly where you're supposed to be. Um, and I think another piece too is really build your support system, whether that is your family, whether that's your friends, whether um, you know you go to therapy and have a therapist, whatever it may be. If you have people in your corner, it makes all the difference. Um, because I think especially with the pandemic and COVID, you're very isolated. I, you know, I'm living for my first for the first time on my own. Um, and so you feel that isolation a lot quicker. And so just having, you know, Abigail, you know, a meme away or having my mom a FaceTime call away, it really makes all the difference as far as me just feeling like, okay, you know, I got this. Um, I'm going to make this day my best, or I'm going to strive to make this my best day. And if it's not today, then maybe it's tomorrow. Um, so yeah, that's my multiple pieces of advice so you're welcome <laughs> I love that. Abigail what about you um yeah I mean I would have to say and I used to roll my eyes every time I heard this growing up but you know I think at the end of the day our hearing loss is what makes us different um it's what makes us unique and just fully embracing that um because you know growing up I you know, you just don't want to be noticed. You're just like, oh, like, why can't I just not have normal hearing like everybody else? I just want to fit in. But then, you know, as you get older, I think it really kind of sets in that there's so many people out there. And, you know, it's just so nice to have something about you that makes you different. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I not I would have gotten opportunities like going on The Bachelor, being able to do these kind of interviews without my hearing loss. Um, and so I think it's just a new, profound appreciation of, you know, yeah, you know, sometimes some days are tough, you know, there's obstacles, of course, but at the end of the day, you know, it's something that makes you different. Um, so I think just for young adults, I think it's not always easy, but I think just the moment that you're able to embrace that and just be really confident in yourself with that, um, it just, it really changes your outlook on life. I love that. Great, great pieces of advice from the two of you. And I'll, I'll end, I will end the episode on that and not try to top that at all. So we'll end that one right there. So I want, um, I want everyone to be able to find the both of you on social media as well, so they can follow both of your journeys and send lots of love your way. Um, so um, for both of you, we'll, uh, we'll start with, we'll go youngest to oldest, then we'll do it the way I like. We'll do that one. So Abigail, where can people find you um, on social media? Yeah, so I'm mainly on Instagram. So my Instagram is Abigail underscore Herringer. Perfect. And then Rachel, what about you? I am on Instagram. I have a lot of videos of my dog. So just FYI. <laughs> um, but my handle is Herringer underscore Rachel. So the opposite oh, of that there, we, uh, uh, there we go. I love the that. Flop. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> and the dog who does not need a dog video on their daily you know I mean that's what I'm saying that's what I'm saying <laughs> I love it. That, thank you I'll tell everyone um as well you can follow Invisi Youth on Twitter Instagram and Facebook at Invisi Youth and you can find the Invisi Youth chat sessions on all audio podcast platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, all of the above, and on our YouTube channel, where if you're watching with me with these lovely ladies, you'll get to see that on our YouTube channel as well and watch the video show of it. So always subscribe, comment, five stars, all the shebang that comes with that. It helps us. I say subscribe because it really helps. Um, and so, like I said, the two of you, thank you so much for being our guests, be for your first dual sibling interview for it to be with us. <laughs> I'm so appreciative to get to spend the hour with you chatting. And I know our listeners and viewers really um, get to learn and feel embraced by the two of you as well. Mm -hmm. So thank you both so much for being on the show. Thank you for having thank us. You. Yeah, what she said. <laughs> <laughs>